Stanford University. My name is Walter Scheidel. I'm the chair of the Classics Department. And it's a great pleasure for me to welcome all of you to what I believe to be the seventh Lawrence Eitner Lecture, a lecture series set up to publicize classics and classical scholarship to a wider audience. Um, it is funded by Peter and Lindsay Joost, great friends and benefactors of Stanford Classics, and named in memory in honor of Professor Lawrence Eitner, uh, who died a few years ago at the age of 89. He used to run what is now the Cantor Art Center for decades, from the early 60s till the earthquake year of 89. Uh, he also ran what was then the Department of Art and Architecture and was really instrumental in turning the art museum into a, a leading uh, regional art facility. Tonight's speaker is Mary Beard, without any doubt one of the best known classicists currently alive anywhere in the world. A fellow of Newnham College, Cambridge, where she had already been a student. Um, she has been teaching classics now for quite some time. I'm not going to tell you how long, but for some time. Uh, is currently professor of classics at you know, Cambridge a fellow of the British Academy, and is in fact in the US in part, not just to give this lecture, but to be inducted as a foreign honorary member into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences just this coming Saturday. But Mary is not your ordinary distinguished classicist, in as much as you can be ordinary and distinguished at the same time, <laughs> because her profile is unusually rich and varied. Of course, as all good academic citizens, she has produced her fair share of work. In fact, uh, one might say much more than just her fair share. Most notably, um, 10 books, if I've counted correctly, so far on various aspects of ancient civilization. One of her main areas of expertise is Roman religion, monumentally on display in the two volume standard reference work, Religions of Rome, that she produced with her colleagues, um, John North and the late Simon Price. Uh, another focal point, one that Professor um, Lawrence Eitner would surely have approved of, is her interest in ancient art and architecture with three books um, to date, Classical Art from Greece to Rome, The Parthenon, and The Colosseum, based on a manuscript left by the late Keith Hopkins, but really largely written by Mary herself. Other books deal with more general aspects of Roman history. Her first book, Rome in the Late Republic, and the recent The Roman Triumph of 2007. She also published a book, a biography, a study of her famous pre-colleague at Newnham, uh, Jane Harrison, one of the most distinguished female classicists of all time. But it's two other books that merit special attention here. One is published back in 1995, Classics, a very short introduction. So if you have very little time and you want to know about classics, this is the book to get. And it fits almost into your uh, pocket of your jacket, almost, because otherwise I would have brought it. To. And uh, her most recent book, The Fires of Vesuvius, Pompeii Lost and Found. I'm singling out those two items because they take us to Mary's activities beyond the ivory tower. For Mary is famous not just among her colleagues, her academic peers, but also among the educated public. Over the years, she has become one of the most prominent voices of classics worldwide. For instance, the book on Pompeii I just mentioned led to the creation of a TV series for the BBC in which Mary provided an update on what we now know about this very famous site, trying to reconstruct the daily life of its inhabitants. For almost 20 <laughs> years now, she has been the classics editor of the Times Literary Supplement, a very prominent perch from which to educate uh, the public, all of us, about developments in our field. And what is now perhaps the most high, prof uh, most high profile venture, of course, is her famous blog, named A Don's Life, which she publishes several times a week on the website of the TLS, the Times Literary Supplement. If you have ever wondered what classic scholars do, what they think about, this is the place to find out. All this shows that Mary Beard is that rare creature, a highly distinguished scholar with an exceptionally broad and wide public reach. 
In fact, Mary doesn't just write the big books, people actually read them, which is clearly not the same thing. Um, I just checked and discovered she's one of the most frequently cited ancient historians in the English-speaking world, which I guess she didn't know till I just mentioned it. Uh, Mary doesn't like me to talk about the size of her book advances. So the only thing I can say <laughs> is that her work has been very, very successful in every respect. And that's <laughs> not true of classicists in general. As I learned recently from an interview in the Cambridge Alumni magazine, which featured Mary among the leading public intellectuals of Britain today, we're not actually supposed to call her a public intellectual because that sounds pretentious to British ears. But luckily, we're in the US. We can say whatever we like, including the truth, <laughs> which is that, of course, Mary is very much a public intellectual, quintessentially public intellectual. In this capacity, she is much sought after and always happy to oblige by maintaining a multimedia presence on the web, from the blog I already mentioned, to her Twitter feed, uh, British radio, television, and the papers. In fact, just this weekend, as I was flying back from New York, I was reading the weekend supplement of the Wall Street Journal, and I thought I could escape Mary's reach just for a few <laughs> minutes doing so, but not so. There she was again in a column entitled Religious Cults in Antiquity, a top five list of Mary's favorite books on Greek and Roman religion. Now, I have no doubt that someone who can persuade the Wall Street Journal to pay attention to gods other than mammon <laughs> is someone who can accomplish anything. And that's why we are so lucky to have her amongst our colleagues and very lucky indeed to be able to welcome her here tonight. So please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Mary. <laughs> I don't really know what to say after that, except I'll see you afterwards. <laughs> now, uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming, and thank you for the invitations. I rashly said at dinner last night I'd come to Stamford whenever anybody invited me, and so um, here I am. Um, but to business. I want to start with this recently discovered celebrity portrait. It was dragged out of the River Rhone at Arles in 2007, and it has already been the subject of a National Geographic television show, a French television documentary, and it has been the centerpiece of its own special exhibition. The reason for its fame is that it is supposed to be a portrait of Julius Caesar. In fact, the underwater archaeologist who found it shouted as soon as he got back to the surface and took a better look, my God, it's Julius Caesar. Or I think he must have shouted, mon Dieu, you know, c'est Jules Caesar, right? Whoops. Uh, it is claimed to be, in other words, one of those holy grails of Roman portrait iconography. It's not just a portrait of Julius Caesar, but actually a portrait of Julius Caesar carved from life in his own lifetime. Now, the fact that it doesn't actually look like any other portraits supposed to be of Caesar, uh, I shall come back to. But suffice it to say at this point that that potentially awkward difficulty has been taken to be a sign of this statue's authenticity. Um, anyway, I start by trailing this new discovery because directly or indirectly, and whether or not you actually count Julius Caesar as a proper emperor or not, it raises some of the main themes of the lecture this evening. It highlights our desire to put a Roman name to a Roman face and or to put a Roman face to a Roman name. Um, nobody actually, at least of all me, much likes going into a museum and meeting rows and rows of people labelled unidentified Roman. So hence, we put a name to them. It also hints, as we shall see, at some of the very odd arguments that we resort to in order to match up a face to a name and the very dodgy methods we are happy to use to do so. And, as I hope to show, it opens up a whole history 
of the naming project, which goes back for centuries and centuries, with all kinds of twists and turns, re-identifications and gloriously overconfident misidentifications. Now, I should stress right at the beginning of this lecture that I am not here to correct any mistakes. I'm not suggesting that there is some magic way to get these identifications right. In a way, I'm going to be doing the reverse. That's to say, concentrating largely on images of Roman emperors and of their partners, I'm going to be suggesting that the misidentification of these characters is at least as important and as culturally and politically productive as the identification of them, going back to antiquity and right up to now. I'm going to be starting off with the ancient world, but the second half of the lecture is going to shift focus to the importance of taking imperial misidentification seriously in the history of Renaissance and later art. The hope is, in fact, that putting ancient sculpture next to versions and adaptations of it by artists as diverse as Veronese, Rubens and Jerome will pay dividends on both sides. So overall, I'm going to be trying to celebrate all the glorious and fascinating ways that archeologists and classicists have got these identifications so very wrong, right? <laughs> OK, images of Caesar, and indeed the history of rival images of Caesar, set the scene for me quite nicely. As I've already said, to find a portrait sculpture of Caesar carved from life has traditionally been one big aim of classical art history and of classical art collecting. Now, it is actually not absurd to imagine that such a portrait of Caesar might have been preserved. Ancient literature makes it pretty clear that there are lots of portraits of Caesar done during his lifetime. And there are about 20 statue bases still surviving, some of them probably contemporary with Caesar himself, which, according to the words inscribed on them, once supported statues of Caesar. The trouble is that none of their statues have survived with them and none of the ancient images that are claimed to be portraits of Caesar now is ever named. Uh, if you want a basic rule of thumb, it is if a bust comes complete with a label saying Julius Caesar, either it or the label is 16th century or later. Right? No statue named Caesar could possibly be Roman. Now, given that, given the mismatch between inscription, statues, and all the rest. The basic coordinates for identifying portraits of Caesar have always been just two, one rather more important than the other. First, and least important, is Suetonius's description of Caesar, written some 200 years after his assassination. So what Suetonius has to say, he was a tall man, a fair complexion, slender build, with a rather full face, or it could actually mean uh, a disproportionately large mouth, um, depending on how you translate the Latin. Um, doesn't help when you're looking to match it. Uh, and lively, dark eyes. And Suetonius stresses he was bald, a feature he disguised in the time-honoured way by combing his hair forward and wearing a large laurel wreath. <laughs> now, it has never been easy to match that description to surviving images, partly, actually, because of Suetonius's emphasis on colour more than anything else. But the real problem is that Suetonius's remark about the rather full face, if that is what it means, not the disproportionately large mouth, seems awkwardly at variance with the second and more important key coordinate for identification, which is the images of Caesar that went onto the coinage during his lifetime. 
And the one most often relied upon, though I have to say there are others that are rather different in character and usually get sidelined, the one most often relied upon is this, a memorable coin struck a few months before the assassination. And it's this image in particular that since the Renaissance has been the favourite touchstone for attempting to identify images of Caesar in the round. People have homed in on the scraggy neck, the rather prominent Adam's apple, the slightly gaunt face, despite what Suetonius claims, and I guess here the cleverly disguised baldness, because he doesn't look bald. The trouble is, though, that even so, there's been a huge amount of disagreement about what statues, what apparently portrait statues remaining, match up to this image best, or even, I think, underlying disagreement about what can count as a good resemblance between a portrait sculpture in the round and a miniature coin. So that I've of the almost 200 statues, uh, and there are just three here, that have been seriously ever proposed as an ancient image of Caesar, and the best ones, an ancient image of Caesar, at least going back to an image made in his lifetime. Of the 200 statues proposed, there is not a single one that has not also been seriously challenged, either because because there are two reasons it can be wrong. Either because while the sculpture is ancient, it certainly isn't Caesar, or because while it might be intended to be Caesar, it certainly isn't ancient. So we're dealing with, as well as ancient statues, of course, Renaissance or later copies, various versions, and outright fakes. So, uh, challenges to these statues come in two ways. They come in either it's the wrong guy or it's the wrong date. Now, I can't this evening be pleased to know go through more than a tiny proportion of these positive squadrons of potential Caesars in all their variety. But what I can do is point to another three, and the last one is the Rhone Caesar from which we started, which and this has been pretty oversimplifying, but which really seem to me to be the main ones that over the last 200 years have been taken to be the canonical image of Caesar and have been hyped and dethroned in turn. It gives you, I think, a nice snapshot of how different generations have claimed the different Caesars for themselves. We're going to start with this guy. I'm calling the Caesar of the British Museum. This came into the BN in 1818 as part of a mixed job lot brought from, bought from a British collector who said he'd got it in Italy. It was originally catalogued as, you guessed it, an unknown Roman. But in 1846, how or by whom we simply haven't a clue, the museum register was altered, dated and altered, to identify it as a statue of Caesar. From then on, for about a century, this was the Caesar of modernity's dreams, and it illustrated almost every biography uh, or study of Caesar that there was. True, one uh, enthusiast conceded in 1892, the artist seems to have forgotten the baldness, or at least downplayed it, and it may not actually have been done absolutely directly from life. But, this writer went on, this statue was done by a man who knew Caesar well and has been so deeply impressed by his personality that he has given us a better portrait of the man than if he had done it from life. <laughs> Others chimed in in much the same terms. Uh, the bust wrote another fan in 18, 19, 18, 1899. The bust represents the strongest personality that ever lived. The man looks perfectly unscrupulous as if no scruple could make him falter in the pursuit of his aim. 
Now, keep that picture in your mind and listen to another description of it by another fan who this time praises the sweet, sad, patient smile. <laughs> that <laughs> that far-off look into the heavens as of one searching the unseen. This is the classic 19th century Caesar. There were, however, always a few residual doubts. As early as the 1860s, the British Museum Handbook had to admit that there were alternative views. There are critics, it wrote, who have strenuously maintained that this is really a portrait of Cicero. <laughs> but by the mid 20th century, doubts of a different sort were growing. This was not Cicero, it was certainly Caesar, all right, but it was an 18th century fake. And in 1961, with a kind of final coup de grace, Bernard Ashmole completely demolished any remaining claims that it might seem to have had to authenticity. The giveaway, Ashmole argued, was the texture of the skin, which had clearly been battered or distressed, as the technical term is, to make the sculpture appear old. Now, it's kind of hard to see in this slide, but I think if you look uh, carefully, you can see that it's kind of, it's got sort of very bad pockmarked texture, as if it had been kind of bashed with a Brillo pad or something. And what Ashmel pointed out particularly is that you could see where this distressing had actually stopped. They hadn't done it all completely correctly. And everybody has believed Ashmole. And in fact, uh, his article, Demolishing Caesar, This Caesar in, in 1961, has never actually been um, undermined. And the Caesar itself has now been in enforced retirement for about 50 years, though it does make occasional outings to star in exhibitions of notorious fakes. <laughs> Conveniently, however, the fortunes of another Caesar were rising to take its place. This portrait head, possibly once belonging to a full-length statue, was discovered in excavations conducted by Lucien Bonaparte, Napoleon's younger brother, at Tusculum in 1825. Now, Bonaparte rather liked it, and he took it to his estate near Turin, where it was identified as an, either an old man or an elderly philosopher. But by the 1930s, when we have to remember that Mussolini's enthusiasm for Roman emperors made images of them well worth discovering, it was the subject of a surprise re-identification by an Italian archeologist. This, he wrote a few years later, was obviously a Caesar portrait taken from life. The similarity with the coins was so striking as to require no words to confirm it. Though he did go on to uh, use some words to confirm it. Look, for example, he said at the wrinkled neck, the prominent Adam's apple, and that the odd bumpy shape of the head, which was supposedly the result, he argued, of two non-life-threatening deformities of the skull, clinocephalia and plagiocephalia, which he now re retrospectively diagnosed for Julius Caesar. All this was absolute confirmation that this was either a portrait taken from life, or perhaps that even more holy grail of holy grails might even have been a portrait taken from Caesar's death mask. When Caesar's death mark was done, I'm not quite sure, but um, that was the argument. And for much of the 20th century, this sculpture provoked much the same kind of gushing as the one in the British Museum. Quotes, the almost imperceptible movement of the slightly lifted head and the momentary contraction of the forehead and the mouth tell of a watchful and superior presence. One has the impression of discerning a certain aristocratic reserve or irony. That was written by a leading archeologist not very long ago, and I will not divulge his name, but anybody who wants to know and ask me afterwards, I will tell them, someone who should have known better. 
It is anyway a far cry from the unidentified old man or old philosopher that he was until the, 18, the, the late 1930s. But the winds of change blew here too. Even the sculpture's most ardent modern admirers no longer particularly want to claim that this is a portrait of Caesar from life. And some of them are prepared to admit indeed that the piece itself is actually relatively crude, or if not crude originally, now very badly corroded. And the biggest claim that you find about it would now be something like this, uh, that it is like some of the other of the 200 portraits, so-called surviving, that it was a later Roman copy of some lost bronze statue that was made in Caesar's lifetime, the, the old story. Uh, and I'm pretty certain that sooner or later, the identification with Caesar will be completely challenged. But anyway, it no longer matters very much because the portrait from the Rhone is now poised to take over as the 21st century's Caesar. It is instantly recognisable as Caesar, so it's claimed from the wrinkled neck and the Adam's apple. And as I hinted a few moments ago, the reason it looks so different from the others that have been identified as Caesar is, of course, because this is the only one that was actually made in Caesar's lifetime. So, of course, it looks different from the feeble imitations that weren't. It was put up in the town of Arles, it was argued, whose patron Caesar, Caesar was. And when Caesar was assassinated, it was hastily chucked in the river to be found 2,000 years later. Now, who knows? Uh, for my own money, it's some local dignitary who just happened to end up in the Rhone. Now, in telling this little story, and I shall be coming back to it at the very end, I'm not simply trying to pour cold water on generations of pretty careful art historical work. And in case anybody wonders, I do actually think still that it is important to try to work out which imperial images are Roman and which are modern versions or fakes. And if we're honest, I think we probably do all share a bit of that visceral drive to identify these nameless heads. So I'm happy to accept that. But the point that I want to make, or is the first point I want to make, is that right or wrong, what's interesting is that the methods we use to make these identifications from the BM in 1846 to the Rome in 2007 the methods we use haven't changed for centuries. Within the art history of Roman portraiture, there is no new scientific magic bullet. All art historians do is compare and contrast. And in a sense, I think, gratifyingly, ancient art history just goes on doing what it's always done. It looks very hard at the objects and chooses the key diagnostic elements for identification. The reason you get different answers is because people pick different key diagnostic features on which to focus. For Caesar, is it the Adam's apple? Is it the wrinkled neck? Is it the overall appearance which sort of matches the coin or what? And I think interestingly too, in this process, we are not necessarily becoming any more sceptical or rigorous about who we find to put the name of Caesar on. It's not a question, as I think we often like to think, of some poor old gullible scholars in the 18th century being overtaken by their hard-headed 21st century successors. If anything, the reverse is the case. Winkelmann, for example, quoted Cardinal Albani as doubting that any genuine heads of Caesar had survived. Now, whatever Albani meant by genuine heads, I very much doubt that he would have been much impressed by this one. It's the first point. There's also, I think, something wonderfully kind of anachronic 
or if you were Walter, I think you'd say circular, right, about the whole process of identification that's going on here. As different versions of Caesar, modern ones as well as ancient ones, combine to determine our vision of him and combine in turn to make some ancient images look more plausible to us than others as images of the great man. And that's one reason why I'm sure that when we come to think properly about imperial portraits, we always have to take ancient images, misidentified or not, together with modern images, because they're all part of the same kind of feedback loop. I mean, to put it simply in relation to these images here, even the most rigorous art historian, at least art historian brought up in the United Kingdom, met Caesar first of all as the image on the bottom right from Asterisk, Asterix, long before they ever looked at a portrait sculpture. In some ways, how we think Caesar is, is determined not only by art historical high ground method, but it's also determined by all the ways we've seen Caesar and been made to think of him ever since we first capable of reading a book. Now, at the very end, I want to come back to uh, that British Museum Caesar. But what I want to do now with Caesar as the backdrop is to move on, first of all, to some portrait images of the imperial family in the first hundred years or so of the empire, looking to start with uh, ancient images as identified by modern historians, and then move on to modern images based on ancient ones. I shall be looking at some early imperial princes, I shall be looking at the Emperor Vitellius, and finally at the Agrippinas, both elder and younger. And my point is that the fluidity of identifications, the kind of palimpsest of recognition and misrecognition, was crucially important in antiquity itself, and that the history of misidentifications of Roman emperors and their women has been more than a simple series of errors, but has actually been a marvellous cultural driver over the last 500 years or so. Put simply, I think by and large, we've been much too preoccupied with getting things right rather than seeing how important the interesting mistakes are. OK, so if we move beyond Caesar to the Julio-Claudian emperors that followed him, the good news, in a way, is the situation becomes quite a lot clearer. The Julio-Claudians lasted a lot longer than Caesar's brief years in power, and there are a few cases where you can more or less marry up a name on a statue base with a statue that might have stood on top of it. And it's also generally easier, I think, to identify the portraits of some of the key imperial figures within the dynasty. I think you'd have to be even more sceptical than I am to start to deny that this was intended as a vision of the Emperor Augustus. Now, I mean a vision or an image. I don't mean that Augustus looked like that, but that uh, the intention behind that image was to create a portrait, inverted commas, of Augustus. And the detailed similarities, particularly in the hairstyles, between some of the images of individual members of the ruling house from Augustus on, images that are found all over the Roman world, has strongly suggested that there were clay or wax models of authorised portrait types of imperial family members disseminated from the centre. And those are the assumptions that have guided, by and large, how for the last 50 years at least, we have looked at these portraits, that there were authorised types whose details were recoverable and distinguishable and identifiable. Now, that's not entirely untrue, but I think it isn't quite the end of the story as much as it's often taken to be. And in fact, although the position <laughs> with the Julio-Claudian emperors is a bit different from Julius Caesar, it isn't as different as what might appear at first sight. For a start, 
beyond the particular similarities that there are between different statues, there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever for the supposed models sent out from the centre to the periphery guiding the portrait type. And there is no evidence at all for the imperial infrastructure that might have disseminated them. You know, goes without saying that you know, we know all kinds of things about the Roman imperial palatial hierarchy and infrastructure, you know, from the hairdressers to the secretaries. There is no trace of the Department of Visual Propaganda at all. And there is certainly no evidence for something that is also claimed that sometimes a new image of the emperor was specially commissioned to coincide with an important imperial event. Emperor becomes consul for the third time and a new authorised image with a slightly different hairstyle is uh, sent out. No evidence whatsoever. So I think one has to be careful about the model idea. Secondly, the stress on these authorised portraits of the imperial family has had an extremely narrowing effect on our view of imperial portraiture in general. Now, look at this one. This is not Roman, by the way. Um, it's by the Papua New Guinean artist Matthias Kawage, and it is a portrait of Queen Elizabeth II, in fact, it's in the Royal Collection at Buckingham Palace. Now, it's this kind of outrider that is literally not seen in our canonical approach to Roman portraiture. Because we are preoccupied with the idea of the authorised, centralised version, we simply don't see the outriders. So, actually, this is one of the few named portraits of Augustus that there is, and it's actually in Pharaonic guise from an Egyptian temple. But third, and this in a sense is the main point that guides the rest of what I've got to say, no matter how hard you study these portraits, how carefully you look at these blasted locks of hair, which are supposed to brand the members of the early imperial house distinctively, you still do not get a firm identity and a consistent set of answers about who is who. So I want to give you a couple of examples of this. Here's a quite simple one. Uh, another statue in the British Museum. And scholars following pretty much the same methodology, one with the other, have labelled this sculpture completely differently over the last couple of decades. He's been labelled as Augustus himself. He's been labelled as Caligula. He's been labelled as Augustus's grandson, Gaius, and of course, he's labelled as Gaius's brother, Lucius. Right. Four imperial contenders in one statue. Slightly more complicated version is on the screen now. Somewhat puzzling sculpture from the Vatican, which shows clear signs actually of having been altered in antiquity. The back of the hair on the far right is very odd. This has had even more different identifications in the last half century. He's been called Augustus, he's been called Caligula, he's been called Nero, he's been called a statue of Augustus reworked into a statue of Nero, and he's also been called a statue of Nero reworked into an Augustus, and he's been a statue of Augustus's grandson Gaius reworked into a statue of Nero. Now, who knows? And it's not even a question that people have been very clear about whether the statues they see were or were not even members of the imperial family. This is a nice pair of figures, one male and one female, from a building next to the Forum in Pompeii. They have been identified in numerous different ways over the last century as Augustus's sister Octavia and her son, or as Augustus's wife Livia and her son Drusus, or perhaps the woman is meant to be Nero's mum, Agrippina, or maybe, as one common view now is, they're not members of the imperial family at all, but they're local burghers of the tiny town of Pompeii, modelling themselves on a certain style 
of imperial image making. We still do not know. Now, over the last 20 years or so, there has been a truly prodigious amount of work trying to draw yet finer and finer distinctions between these different portrait images. And as I said, focusing particularly on the precise layout of the locks of the hair, you know, at its most extreme, almost denying any other general physiognomical resemblance is at all relevant. As long as it's got the right hairstyle, no matter what its face looks like, it's the guy with that hairstyle. And the basic assumption, as I've said, is that there was some official prototype for these and that each emperor or prince would have his own particular model portrait and particular authorised hairstyle transmitted through the clay or wax models sent out from the centre. Now, quite a lot of this work has been extremely and keenly observant. But it does seem to me to miss one crashingly obvious point. That as far particularly as the princes and the emperors of the Julio-Claudian house is concerned, this is dynastic art, and these portraits are intentionally trading on similarity as much, if not more, as they're trading on difference. So you might even say that there was a kind of perverse academic skill at work here. I mean, that is to say, we're dealing with a whole group of sculptures whose overwhelming characteristic is they all look very like each other. And for centuries, the whole effort of scholarship has been to try to show us how different they are. Now, it seems to me that we need to think about the similarity and what the similarity and the intense and wonderful potential for confusion is actually doing. And that obviously means thinking back to the succession problems of this imperial house. If you imagine a world in which there were no rules for the hierarchy of succession, Augustus and Livia have no children together, and that their chosen heirs keep dying off inconveniently early all over the place, you very quickly see that visual images have a very key role to play here. They're not just, as we're often told, forcing the image of the emperor into the field of vision of his subjects. They are also, crucially, mechanisms for parading and legitimating succession. What they're doing is making the air look the part, and looking the part means looking like, even if not quite identical to, the ruling emperor whom you want to succeed. And they're making every ruling emperor of the Julio-Claudian dynasty look very like Augustus, to whom ultimately the right to rule was traced. We find it hard to distinguish them, and certainly the ancient observer would have too if there hadn't been a convenient inscription underneath. And indeed, they're supposed to find it hard. We are, should find it hard to tell these apart. That is their point. There is really what's going on, I suppose, is a trade-off between some elements of individuality, but crucially, the identical brand image of the Julio-Claudian prince, which means that they're all meant to look the same. Modern scholarship, in other words, has got this project wrong. It concentrates on looking for difference in imagery, but what is the key factor is the elusive identification, the similarity, and the constructive blurring of dynasty that underlies them all. So, crucially important to see these imperial busts look the same. Now, let's fast forward a millennium and a half and see some of the impact of that kind of elusive identification or false certainties about which emperor is which, working for us in even more intriguing ways. It has an ancient root 
but we can also put this to work in interesting ways. So my point now, final point really, is a related one to what I've been saying, um, but in a sense taking it further. That is to say that in looking at the long durée of ancient imperial image making, we need to pay attention to and to enjoy the wrong identifications as much as the possibly right ones. And I'm going to start from a deceptively simple example, which concerns the short-lived Emperor Vitellius, who you see here getting, um, <laughs> having his life shortened, um, who briefly ruled in 69, renowned for brutality and gluttony before he in turn is brutally murdered and chucked in the Tiber. Um, this is a different world from Julio-Claudian dynastic continuity. Now, key image. Portrait on the screen here was supposed to have been unearthed in Rome in excavations and building work sponsored by Cardinal Grimani in the 16th century and was given to him, given by him to the city of Venice in 1523, where it still is in the Archaeological Museum. Straight away, it seemed a perfect match for some of Vitellius's coins and it quickly became known as the Grimani Vitellius. No, modern scholarship has entirely denied that identification. For us, this is certainly not a portrait of Vitellius, though opinion is divided on what it is. Um, either a portrait of somebody in the second century, identity unknown, or a 16th century pastiche never actually dug up like Grimani claimed, but confected to look Roman. But as one of the most famous misidentifications of sculpture of all time, it stood for Vitellius in the cultural imagination for centuries and centuries. You find him absolutely everywhere. And misidentification or not, if you follow its implications through, you find an awful lot more at stake in this face of Vitellius than you might think. Wrong as it is, a lot hangs on the Vitellius signifier here. Just want to give you a few examples of that. He has actually a cameo role, you might not spot him yet, in this vast and famous canvas by Thomas Couture called Romans in the Decadence of the Empire. It's about 15 by 25 feet, this canvas. And it's a complex and rich reflection on Roman imperial vice, as well as being, as almost every critic hammered home uh, in the 19th century, a scarcely disguised allegory for the corruption of contemporary French society. But for the moment, I simply want to pinpoint the Vitellius figure, who is not actually hard to spot. There he is, about to fall into a drunken sleep next to the slightly icy maiden who is not looking at him. And if you could see this in really big detail, you'll see instantly it is the Grimani Vitellius uh, reworked the here in painting. Now, up to a point, What's going on here is a simple little bit of artistic borrowing. But it's more than that, I think. It seems to me that the misidentified Vitellius here is steering how we read this scene. Because Vitellius is not merely a libertine, and so not merely the kind of figure that you'd expect to find in a picture of an imperial orgy. We also know that Vitellius suffered terrible punishment for his immorality, as we've seen. So here in this painting, it seems to me that he's operating as a kind of glimpse of the future. He's here as a guarantee of what's going to happen next, that the decadence that Couture was conjuring up will indeed be horribly punished. Something may also be similarly at stake in this painting. This is one of Jerome's famous gladiatorial scenes, and it's now usually entitled Hail Caesar, Those About to Die. But in the 19th century, the painting was normally called Gladiators in Front of Vitellius. And that's because 
the tiny figure of the emperor in his box, which we only just see, is again the Grimani Vitellius. Now, actually, as Jerome well knew, the Colosseum, which is what the building clearly is, was certainly not built by the reign of Vitellius. So why does Jerome flout the chronology? Why did he make the mistake? Well, maybe because he was just putting a pastiche together in which such incongruities didn't really matter. Maybe Jerome was being uncharacteristically sloppy. Or perhaps, and this is what I would rather see, by using the figure of this instantly identifiable, even if misidentified, Vitellius, he is helping us to read the moral dynamics of the scene that we are witnessing. But appearances of Vitellius get even more intriguing in paintings that take us outside the classical world in the normal sense of the term. Now, here on the screen, is one of Veronese's most famous and controversial paintings. It's done in Venice for the refectory of a Venetian religious order. And what has prompted most discussion about it is the fact that it was originally almost certainly painted as a Last Supper, but then was strategically renamed by Veronese after the Inquisition had objected to several features of it that they deemed unsuitable. And rather than change the painting, Veronese changed the name, and it was to be called, after another biblical banquet, the Feast at the House of Levi, which is how it is now known. Now, the figure I'm interested in is this one. The large servant in the foreground, who's often picked out in analyses of this painting because he's looking directly at Jesus as if he were transfixed. And many people have seen that this makes it in some ways a scene of conversion. The servant is looking directly at Jesus and it looks as if what's going on is the light is dawning. But if you look closer at him, you will also see that the servant has the face of the Grimani Vitellius. So why does he hear? Well, I think there's surely an interesting and edgy engagement between the painting and the historical resonance of Vitellius himself. Here we've got the most luxurious and extravagant glutton among the Roman emperors paraded here as a servant at a Christian banquet. The reversal is a pointed one but it's also one that's intensified in the Veronese by enacting, as it were, the very conversion of Rome's imperial monster and Venice's best-known Roman statue right in the foreground of it. There's really big ideological loading of this painting. The fact that we know that this isn't Vitellius is immaterial to that reading of it. But let's just quickly look at some ladies who've got rather missed out of this. And I want to turn to the last example, to the figure of Agrippina, or rather the two Agrippinas. First of all, the elder Agrippina, who was the wife of Germanicus, the one who grieved nobly for her dead husband and brought his ashes back to Rome, uh, the woman who took widowly virtue to the point of being actually a frightful pain in the butt and was exiled by Tiberius and starved herself to death. Agrippina number one and Agrippina number two, uh, her daughter, the younger Agrippina, the wife of Claudius, whom she supposedly murdered, and the mother and lover and eventually victim of the Emperor Nero. Now, issues of Agrippina's identity, contested and mistaken, come to the fore all over the place. There are hundreds of possible Agrippinas in Roman sculpture, looking even more indistinguishable, as women tend to do, than the imperial princes. But the issues particularly here home in relation to this Roman statue in the Capitoline Museums at Rome. It's been on display there since the 17th century, and it is now thought to be either an unknown lady of the second century AD or a fourth century AD statue of the Emperor Constantine's mother. But leave those aside, through the 18th and 19th century, she was Agrippina, 
and she was one of the highlights of the tourist trail to Rome. Problem was, however, it was never quite clear which Agrippina she was. And visitor reactions to her varied enormously according to which Agrippina they had in mind. Either they see in her face the long signs of suffering virtue as she planned to starve herself to death, or the, quote, mild, pathetic, deep despair of the woman who was about to be murdered by her son and lover, the Emperor Nero. Okay? Touristic ambivalence, however, was one thing, but it actually became a strongly politicised ambivalence in the early 19th century, when Canova was commissioned to sculpt a portrait of Napoleon's mother, and the model he chose was the Agrippina of the Capitoline. Now, this proved to be controversial in almost every way. Um, first, because the fine line between creative imitation and sheer plagiarism was rather finer than usual here. Uh, and most critics, I'm afraid, thought that Canova's work was a cheap copy. But even more to the point was the question of which Agrippina it was. And so, to which Agrippina Letizia Bonaparte was being likened. And critics, again, played fast and loose, largely according to their political alignment with the Bonapartists. Was Letizia to be seen, as no doubt she wanted, as the virtuous elder Agrippina, or was she being satirised as a new Agrippina the Younger, her strained relations with Napoleon, giving that option a particular piquancy? Of course, the real joke or the real insult reflected on the sun, because if there was an honourable option for Letizia here, in seeing her as Agrippina the Elder, there certainly wasn't one for Napoleon himself. For the one thing that both Agrippinas, good and bad, had in common was their truly terrible sons. The mad Caligula, in the case of Agrippina the Elder, and the mad Nero, in the case of Agrippina the Younger. And there were not a few critics and commentators who felt indeed that that was the point, that Canova was using Agrippina as a way of getting at Napoleon. And that is a fairly well-known story, and the sheer ambivalence of the identification is its point. But in this one final example, I want to focus on a work of art in which the chain of ambiguities has not, in my view, ever been recognised and has prevented us seeing what the painting is about. I'm talking about this famous Rubens in the National Gallery in Washington, which is currently labelled Germanicus and Agrippina, uh, implying that it is the virtuous elder Agrippina with the husband of hers who was killed, probably at Tiberius's instigation. Now, this is actually a common pose for ancient couples, and Rubens certainly, uh, I think, had some ancient model in mind. So where is the problem? Well, simply, the earliest identification of this painting is not Germanicus and Agrippina at all, but it's Tiberius and Agrippina. And that is how it entered the National Gallery, and that is the title it's given in 1710 in the earliest catalogue entry of it uh, in a, a collection in Vienna. It was re-identified in the 1960s and officially renamed Germanicus and Agrippina. There were various reasons for this and in fact Actually, the ancient iconography of Tiberius and Agrippina is difficult to distinguish. But the bottom line for the reason for re-identifying it was that to the modern eye, the pair of Tiberius and Agrippina just didn't seem to work at all. That's to say, what on earth, if this was the elder Agrippina, what on earth was she doing in side-by-side -side marital pose with the emperor Tiberius who forced her to suicide? Well, there is an answer which involves an even further uh, case of mistaken identity. What I've not reminded you of or confessed is there were not just two Agrippinas, there were three Agrippinas. If you look at the family tree, you'll remember or see that Agrippina the Elder had a half-sister called Vipsania Agrippina. Now, we normally call this Agrippina Vipsania, 
simply in order to cut down the number of bloody Agrippinas we're dealing with and so not to get confused. Right? But in Roman writers and through to the 18th century, this Vipsania Agrippina was also known, like the other two, as Agrippina. And who was she? She was, of course, the first wife of Tiberius. So who is this painting of? Well, it could be Germanicus and the elder Agrippina, as the current identification has it. And that would certainly be the more standard pairing. But I think you get a very powerful reading of the painting if you think, along with the earliest catalogue entry, that it is Agrippina number three, Vipsania Agrippina. Let me just explain. Tiberius as emperor is usually portrayed as a morose, hypocritical and vengeful old bastard. But according to... It's true, right? According to Suetonius, there was just one woman he really loved. It was his wife, Vipsania Agrippina. He loved her devotedly, but was forced by his stepfather, the Emperor Augustus, to divorce her and to marry Augustus' own daughter for reasons of dynastic convenience. He had no choice but to do what Augustus said, but he never got over the divorce. According to Suetonius, on one occasion, he caught sight of his Vipsania Agrippina in the street and followed her weeping, and his henchmen made sure he never caught sight of her again. My question is, could there be a better image to capture the relationship between Tiberius and she who we call Vipsania than this one? This, in other words, is a story about identification, misidentification, naming and modern renaming. And it's a nice reminder that current certainties and current names of who is who in the imperial family are not necessarily better than the dismissed certainties of two or three centuries ago. It is a bit of a game of smoke and mirrors. And the same is true for ancient marble busts too. And just as a final coda, I want to go back to one of the images of Caesar that I started from. This one in the British Museum, now dismissed without much thought as a fake. Earlier this year, I went to have a careful look at him in the museum. And certainly, one sees what Ashmole saw. He's got distressed skin, and he doesn't, certainly doesn't look like an image of Caesar in the first century BC. But when I turned him round, that is what I found behind his ears. What it appears to be is unfinished drill work. Looks as if uh, the ears, the, in that awkward bit for sculptural disaster of the bit of space that you have to put between the ear and the head, the sculptor has just made the drill holes but has not yet finished actually finally kind of freeing the ear. Now, it is possible that that is still a fake. Either, you know, just as some ancient sculptures are unfinished, so some fakes are unfinished. Or even it could be a kind of faking double bluff. But the likelihood is that that bit of unfinished drill work, which Ashmole barely mentioned, when he is so concerned to tell us about the distressed face. It looks to me as if that unfinished ear makes it quite, not, not overwhelmingly, but strongly likely that these portrait, that portrait, even if it isn't Caesar, is not actually the fake that Ashmole thought it was. In a sense, what it reminds us is that Issues of identification, whether they're mistaken or not, are never in this game final. It's always work in progress. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.